you all seem to really enjoy my last video on Japanese cases, so today I thought it would be fun to explore some more unsolved mysteries from the country. And believe me, there's no shortage of bizarre and unsettling content to cover. So join me as we take another journey to the land of the rising sun, and see what dark mysteries are lurking in its shadows. But just before we do, I'd like to introduce today's sponsor, Kamikoto Knives. Kamikoto makes these high quality kitchen knives crafted from real Japanese steel, using traditional techniques that date back to the Edo period, giving them a very distinct look and feel. Each blade goes through a rigorous 19 step process that takes several years to complete from start to finish, after which they're all individually inspected to ensure they meet Kamikoto's high standards. To prove just how much Kamikoto believe in the craftsmanship of their products, all of their knives come with a lifetime guarantee. The knives themselves come in this gorgeous, heavy duty, ashwood storage box, which complements the authenticity of the blades inside, and makes for a present that really has that wow factor. But Kamikoto knives are more than just beautiful objects. With their super sharp, single bevel edges, they're some of the best tools on the market, used by Michelin star chefs around the world. Sharp, specialised and perfectly weighted, they make even a novice home cook like myself feel more confident and capable. So if you're ready to level up your cooking game, or know someone who would appreciate these Japanese steel treasures, then simply head over to kamikoto.com forward slash lazy. Right now they have several special offers going on, and on top of those, are offering my viewers an extra $50 off any purchase. Just make sure to use my discount code, lazy. Again, that's kamikoto.com forward slash lazy. Use my discount code, L-A-Z-Y, and grab your set today. There's a number of strange superstitions surrounding bathrooms in Japan. Toilets are the unexpected setting of a lot of urban legends there. For example, Akamanto, aka Red Cape, a masked spirit who appears to people in public bathroom stalls. If the occupants run out of toilet paper, Akamanto will offer them a roll of either red or blue paper. If you choose the red paper, you'll meet an immediate bloody end. The spirit may flay you alive, or rip the spine from your body and wrap it around your neck like a cape. If you choose the blue paper, Akamanto will place his hands around your throat and squeeze until your face turns blue. Try and outsmart him by picking another colour, and a pair of hands will drag you to the underworld. Your only viable option is to make a run for it without wiping, so there's really no winning in this game. Now those type of stories are popular among high schoolers and fans of the paranormal, sure, but ultimately no one really believes them, and they're just seen as a bit of fun. There are however, some genuinely unsettling figures that lurk in Japanese public bathrooms, namely Peeping Toms. Things have gotten a lot better in recent years, but in the not so distant past, Japan had a real problem with pervs. Men who go around following, grabbing and photographing women. In many ways, that's still a big problem in Japanese society, and it's the reason that trains in the country have female-only carriages, and why phone cameras can't be switched to silent mode. But one place in particular that these men seemingly couldn't help but venture into back in the day was women's bath stalls. Which brings us to our first entry from Tomura County, a rural area in Fukushima. It was the cold, dark night of February 28th, 1989. A female school teacher named Yumi Tanaka went into a restroom just outside her single person dormitory. Inside was an old fashioned squat toilet, a simple model where the septic tank was U shaped. One end of the pipe was connected to the toilet inside the bathroom, and the other to the outside world. You'd drop your business down the bathroom end of the pipe, and periodically it would all get sucked out from the other end by a machine. After using the squat toilet, Yumi looked down into it, and noticed something bizarre. There was a leather shoe deep inside the toilet. Confused, she went outside to open the concrete lid of the septic tank, but found it was already ajar. She gazed down into this opposite end of the pipe, and what she saw made her heart skip. Squashed inside the thin septic tank, covered in human waste, was the frozen body of Naoyuki Kano a 26-year-old man who worked for the local power plant. An autopsy would later reveal that he had died two days prior, 
due to a combination of pressure on his chest and hypothermia. Investigators were stunned to find him in such a strange position. He was lying on his back in the fetal position, his head positioned just under the squat toilet. Despite the freezing temperatures, Naoyuki's torso was completely bare, and his shirt was found neatly folded atop his body. One of his shoes was on top of his face, that's the one Yumi had seen. His other shoe was later found on the bed of a river, quite some distance from his body. His car was discovered close to the bathroom, with the keys still in the ignition, and the doors unlocked. The authorities quickly closed the case, concluding that Naoyuki must have squeezed into the pipe in order to peep up at women as they used the bathroom, and to enjoy the feeling of their waist covering him. Naoyuki's friends and family were outraged by that assertion. The young man was known for being an upstanding, sunny, moral citizen. He had helped many of the locals with odd jobs and problems they were facing, and was well known in the community. He was also the Minister of Entertainment and Activities of the local youth club, and was considered a role model by all the young members. There was no way such an intelligent and sweet guy perished doing something so shameful and foolish. They believed that Naoyuki had been the victim of foul play. More than 4,300 local villagers signed a petition for Naoyuki's case to be reopened, but the authorities denied their request. The coroner had ruled that Naoyuki only had minor abrasions on his knees and elbows, with no noticeable wounds suggesting that he had been forced inside the pipe. So, in short, there are two possibilities when it comes to this case. Either Naoyuki had gone into the pipe willingly for his own gratification, or he was put in there by somebody else. But was there any evidence that he had been murdered? Actually, there were several pieces. Firstly, the pipe he was trapped in was tight, and I mean extremely tight. Naoyuki's shoulders were 16 inches wide, but the diameter of the pipe which he had slid into was only 14 inches. The recovery crew couldn't pull his body out, no matter how hard they tried, and the entire pipe had to be destroyed just to get him out. As Naoyuki slid himself face up into the pipe and shimmied his way down, he must have realized there was no way for him to get out. He wouldn't have been able to get past the ceramic toilet above him, and it would have been impossible to crawl out backwards. Would he really have put himself in such a risky position just to fulfill a fantasy? Even if he had, the lighting in the bathroom was so weak he wouldn't have been able to see anything anyway. Secondly, his missing shoe being found so far from his body didn't make any sense at all. Why would Naoyuki have thrown one of his shoes into a river so far from his destination, and then crawled into the pipe with the other in his hand? Thirdly, it wouldn't have been possible for Naoyuki to neatly fold his shirt while stuck within the confines of the pipe. He must have folded it before he went inside. But if it was so cold, why did he remove it at all? If he didn't want to get it dirty, surely he would have just left it outside. Fourthly, the fact that he had perished from hypothermia was odd. Most people who have fallen or crawled into septic tanks in the past have either died from drowning or from breathing in toxic fumes. It's not clear how much waste was inside the pipe, but surely the fumes would have still been potent enough to end Naoyuki's life at a faster rate than the cold. Finally, remember Yumi Tanaka, the woman who found Naoyuki's body. Well, Naoyuki knew her. They were close friends. Between the 24th and 28th of February, Yumi was away visiting relatives outside the village. Naoyuki would have been very familiar with her schedule, and almost certainly would have known that. Even if he didn't know she was gone for some reason, he had still perished on the 26th. That was a Saturday. Yumi was never at her dorm on the weekends. If Naoyuki wanted to peep up at her so desperately, why did he stuff himself into her bathroom pipe when she wasn't there, knowing that he would have to wait inside it for at least two whole days? In the minds of many, the only possible answer is that he didn't get into it willingly. But if someone else had stuffed Naoyuki into the pipe, who and why? Well, there are a few theories. Just before the incident, Naoyuki's village had a mayoral election. One of the candidates was a man named Tadashiro Watanabe. Naoyuki had been a supporter of Tadashiro's, 
That is, until he learned Tadashiro was actually corrupt and had been buying votes from the local villagers. This strategy worked, and Tadashiro was voted in as the village mayor. Now Yuki was furious, and being a man of principle, immediately turned his back on Tadashiro. On February 23rd, five days before his remains were discovered, now Yuki played a show with his punk band at a local restaurant. Now he was a very outspoken young man, and consumed by anger, he thrashed his guitar while singing lyrics that berated the villagers, mocking them for being so easily manipulated. And this sparked an argument between Naoyuki and several men from the youth club that supported Tadashiro, the youth club Naoyuki was the minister of. In their eyes, their role model Naoyuki had just betrayed them, betrayed Tadashiro. According to witnesses, these men followed Naoyuki out to his car. Some people speculate that they forced Naoyuki into his own vehicle, drove him out to the septic tank, knocked him out somehow, and, while he was still alive, stuffed him inside it. Naoyuki then woke up in the cold, dark pipe, realized his situation, and, unable to get out, squeezed himself into the fetal position for warmth, only to succumb to the freezing temperatures two or three days later. So, had this all been a setup? A way to get rid of Tadashiro's outspoken critic, Naoyuki, and pin him as being a peeping Tom, desperate for a glance up at his friend, Yumi Tanaka. Had these men actually not intended to kill Naoyuki at all, and stuffed him inside the pipe as some sort of joke gone wrong? It's worth noting that the police handled this case very crudely, mishandling Naoyuki's remains, and accidentally destroying evidence. It's also worth noting that the coroner who examined Naoyuki's remains just so happened to quit his job after declaring there had been no foul play. Had the mayor himself pulled some strings and got his young group members off the hook, and ordered the authorities to flush the evidence, so to speak. It doesn't seem likely that the young men would have killed Naoyuki over such a minor gripe. But then again, it also doesn't seem likely that he'd crawl into the pipe willingly himself. There are a few other theories floating about online, ranging from Naoyuki being slain for being an outspoken supporter of nuclear energy, to him being silenced by the very plant he worked at for knowing some of their nefarious secrets but there's not much evidence to support any of them. He may have been a peeping Tom. He may have been a victim. All I know is that now Yuki suffered one of the worst fates imaginable. Trapped in a cold, dark pipe, unable to move, and covered in human waste. A big shout out to Kyoto Rabato, for his amazing video on this case. It was a super helpful resource. Yokkaichi is a small city, located in Mie Prefecture, just a stone's throw away from Nagoya. On February 17th, 2004, one of its residents, an unnamed 68-year-old man whom we'll call Ojisan, was shopping in the city's Jusko. Jusko, or as they're now known, Aeon, are a chain of department stores popular throughout Japan. Places where you can buy anything from fruit and veg, to mattresses, to 15 minutes in a massage chair. They're large, accessible, and almost always very busy. For their shoppers' convenience, all of their department stores have an ATM corner. Ojisan had just spent the last of his money on groceries, and with both of his hands clutching heavy shopping bags, he slowly approached the cash machines. Preoccupied with his shopping, he failed to notice the woman lingering around the ATMs. She blended in with the rest of the shoppers, with her hood up and an infant strapped to her chest. She had been standing there for the past five minutes, but in all that time hadn't taken out any money. Ojisan withdrew his yen and began heading towards the store's main exit. But just as he was about to leave, the woman quickly approached him and intentionally bumped into his shoulder. Feigning surprise, as if the whole thing had been an accident, she gently began running her hands over his pockets. Ojisan quickly realized that she was trying to steal the money he had just withdrawn. He may have been 68, but his hands moved quickly, and he grabbed his wallet at the exact same time she did. They grappled for a moment, the woman desperately trying to pry the wallet from Ojisan's grasp. Realizing she wouldn't be able to overpower him, she instead 
grabbed onto his arm and collar and began screaming, Dorobo! Meaning, thief. Without hesitation, three nearby shoppers ran over. They saw how distressed the woman appeared and the infant she had with her and immediately assumed that the old man must be attacking her. They pinned Ojisan to the ground, restrained him, and tried to pry the wallet from his grip to give to the woman. But Ojisan refused to be robbed, and he held onto his wallet with such vigor that several of the bank cards inside it snapped. He pleaded with the shoppers holding him down, telling them that he was innocent, that she was the one trying to rob him. But the shoppers wouldn't listen. Instead, they called the authorities. Two young, inexperienced officers just so happened to be nearby and were the first ones to respond. Seeing just how frantic Ojisan was, they immediately put him in handcuffs and forced him to stay on the floor. They handled the situation so aggressively that they even broke a lens in his glasses. For the next 20 minutes, Ojisan was held down with one of the officers kneeling on top of him. The 68-year-old began groaning, throwing up, and even lost consciousness. The stress and brutality of the situation had spiked his blood pressure. Still, the officers refused to take off his handcuffs or call for medical assistance. Eventually, more experienced officers arrived and saw just how poorly these rookies were handling things. They asked where the supposed victim was, the woman, but the rookies had no clue. By that point, she was already long gone, having slipped away into the crowd without anyone noticing. Realizing Ojisan was in a bad way, these new officers took off his handcuffs and called for an ambulance. But the damage had already been done. Ojisan had gone into cardiac arrest. He died the following day. The police filed charges against him the day after he passed, despite there being no evidence he had committed a crime, and without even knowing who or where the woman was. Thankfully, there were some diligent officers who didn't like the way the case was being handled and took it upon themselves to investigate. After examining Jusko's CCTV footage, they quickly determined that Ojisan had been telling the truth. The unknown woman had indeed tried to steal his cards. He was completely innocent. And yet, he was dead, and this woman had escaped justice. The hunt for her began. But despite having touched Ojisan's wallet and bank cards, she hadn't actually left behind any fingerprints, so detectives were forced to track her down by other means. Due to strict privacy laws in Japan, the authorities have never released the CCTV footage of this incident to the public. The laws there surrounding privacy are so strict, in fact, that even stills from such footage are rarely ever distributed. In this case, however, they made an exception. Forensic artists took two still images of the woman captured on the surveillance cameras and enhanced them to give a clearer picture of what she looked like. In 2005, one year after the incident had taken place, they released them to the public. People immediately noted the strong, uncanny valley quality of this picture in particular, and soon internet users began referring to the woman as the Jusko Zombie. Her face appeared completely inhuman, dead, synthetic even, as if it were made from plastic. According to eyewitnesses at the scene, however, the woman definitely wasn't wearing a mask. They were able to give a clear, detailed description of her to the authorities. She was between 25 and 30 years old, and was dressed in dark clothing. She was short, at around 5 foot 2, had shoulder length, brown hair and, judging from her appearance and accent, was a Japanese native. They described her facial features as being very unusual. That much everyone agreed with. Much like the woman's face, the infant strapped to her was also real, and wasn't a realistic looking doll, as some internet users suggested. Investigators theorized that the woman must have been local to the area, since she wasn't caught on any other cameras leaving the scene, and likely knew the best escape routes. Since these images were released one year after the incident had taken place, they didn't result in any new leads. To this day, nobody knows who this woman was, or whether she struck again. And since the statute of limitations has already passed in this case, nobody's actively looking for her. It wasn't until March 2011 
that the authorities officially acknowledged Oji-san's innocence, meaning that for seven long years, his reputation was left tarnished. In the end, Oji-san's family took the police to court. They denied being responsible for Oji-san's demise, and claimed to have handled the case professionally and competently. In May 2011, the police paid Oji-san's family an insulting $125 in compensation. Thankfully, the Nagoya High Court stepped in and ordered them to pay $350,000 instead. A definite improvement, though obviously no amount of money could bring their loved one back. Unfortunately, though these types of incidents are rare in Japan, they're far from unheard of. I've even seen something like this happen firsthand in Kobe. A woman was grappling with a man over a backpack, screaming that he was trying to steal it from her, and saying that he was hurting her. We kept a hand on the bag and called the police, and in the end, it turned out that the bag actually belonged to the man. The poor guy just kept stammering, why is this happening to me? Luckily, he didn't suffer the consequences of her actions, unlike poor old Oji-san. The Yakuza are somewhat romanticised in the West. From the video games we play, to the dramas we watch on TV, they're often presented as slick, noble and intelligent. A classier and more sophisticated breed of mafioso, at least compared to other nations' organised crime outfits. Indeed, even in Japan, they were, and to some extent still are, portrayed as underground businessmen, with a strong sense of honour, loyalty, and even their own unique brand of morality like modern-day samurai in suits. One man who hated that stereotype was Juzo Itami, a famous Japanese director. He saw the Yakuza for what they really were, a bunch of low-IQ brutes and thugs, manipulated by a few more intelligent brutes and thugs. In his mind, they had no morals, no values, and most certainly, no honour. He wanted to expose them and show the world what they really were, and, as a writer-director, that was something he was positioned to do. Juzo really hit it big with his 1992 comedy, Mimbo no Ona, or The Gentle Art of Japanese Extortion, a film that satirised the Yakuza and made them look like absolute morons. Making fun of the Yakuza was extremely rare in Japanese media at the time. After all, your reputation in Japan is of the utmost importance. Juzo Itami had just damaged the Yakuza's image, and they weren't going to let that slide. Six days after Mimbo premiered, Juzo was ambushed by five members of the Gotogumi, a gangster clan. They held him down, beat him, and slowly sliced his face up. After the attack, he was rushed to the hospital, and thankfully made a full recovery. Specifically because of this incident, there was a national crackdown on gangsters and their activities. But the message was made clear. Juzo Itami was a marked man. One more film like that, and he'd face even more severe repercussions. Now after that, most men would have been too intimidated to continue criticising the Yakuza. But not Juzo. He refused to bow down to such scare tactics, and in 1997 began working on a new film. This time, a documentary, which aimed to expose the gangsters of Tokyo and their political ties. That was a project he'd never get to finish. On December 20th, 1997, Juzo Itami was found outside his office building in Tokyo, splattered on the ground. He had seemingly jumped from the roof. On his desk, he had left a note explaining his decision to jump. Apparently, a journalist was about to publish an article detailing an affair he was having behind his wife's back. The note said that the claims were false, and that he believed ending his own life was the best way to prove his innocence and clear his name. Two days later, a newspaper did indeed publish an article about the supposed affair, and so the investigators quickly closed the case, concluding that Juzo's note had been authentic. But many people, including Juzo Itami's own family, believe he was actually thrown from the roof. In their minds, there's no way Juzo would have ended it all over a real or fake accusation like that. They instead believe that he was slain by Tokyo's Gotogumi before he could make his expose. Indeed, in 2008, a former member of the Gotogumi 
told an American journalist, quote, We dragged Juso up to the roof and put a gun in his face. We gave him a choice. Jump and you might live, or stay and we'll blow your face off. He jumped. He didn't live. Now it's possible the man was lying for street cred, or to sell his story, but given how the Gotogumi reacted when Mimbo was released, I think his story sounds extremely plausible. Whatever the exact circumstances, most of Juzo's fans seem to believe that this was a hit. Juzo Itami had made a career out of mocking his own culture and its practices. He wasn't the type of man who'd effectively seppuku himself out of shame. They think it's much more likely that the ones feeling ashamed were the Gotogumi. Ashamed that the crude, brutish reality of their lives was being revealed by a man much more noble and intelligent than them. Unlike the Yakuza, Juzo Itami was a brave and honest man, and it was probably for those virtues that he lost his life. This mystery has been making the rounds recently, with channels like Goosebuse and Blame It On Jorge uploading some very detailed videos investigating it. But I thought it would make a nice addition to this list, for reasons that will soon become clear. Most of you are no doubt familiar with this image associated with the Jeff the Killer creepypasta, the story of a teenage slayer with a mutilated face. The original's not a great read, let's be honest, but this associated picture has to be one of the most iconic horror images to circulate around the internet, and where most pictures from the creepypasta era have faded from people's memories, this one persists. What some of you may not know, however, is that the image itself is shrouded in mystery. In short, nobody knows where it came from. It's obviously a heavily edited photo, but to this very day, its origin remains unclear. For the past decade, creepypasta fans across the globe have been playing detective, trying to track down the original photo and unveil the face of the real person that Jeff's based on. And it's actually been a wilder search than you might think. Let's get into it. What many people think of as the original Jeff story hit the internet in 2011, but the character was actually first conceived all the way back in 2008 by a guy called Sousa. Sousa posted this short background on old Jeffy on Newgrounds, along with the now infamous picture. In an interview with Scare Theatre, Sousa claimed that he had taken the photo himself using a white latex mask and a pair of plastic eyes. He couldn't prove this, however, because apparently he had lost the mask soon after taking the photos. But we know that's not the case. Firstly, because the image is obviously photoshopped and not a mask. And secondly, as internet sleuths later discovered, Sousa's post wasn't the first time this image appeared on the internet. One year earlier, in 2007, a Japanese video titled NNN Special Broadcast was uploaded to YouTube. The video itself is a recreation of a then popular Japanese urban legend that involved a late night news broadcast. According to the story, a young man who was having trouble sleeping turned on his TV at 2.30 a.m. He switched channels to the Nippon News Network, but was met with nothing but static. Then, suddenly, coloured bars filled the screen. The words NNN Ring Hoso appeared alongside a photo of an abandoned factory. A list of seemingly random names slowly scrolled down the screen, followed by the words Tomorrow's Sacrifice, the implication being that all the named individuals would die the next day. The broadcast supposedly ended with several weird images and sound effects. The YouTube video stays faithful to the legend, but what's interesting is that at the end, the Jeff the Killer image briefly flashes on screen, just before the video cuts to black and we're left with the message, Oyasumi Nasai. Good night. So, it appeared as if the famous Jeff image actually had Japanese roots. That made a lot of sense, seeing how nobody in the West knew what the original image was. That theory only solidified after the Jeff image was found in an archive post from Pia.cc a now defunct message board that was popular in Japan back in the day. The post, titled Kowa Ahyahyahyahya, or Scary Ahyahyahyahya, was made all the way back in November of 2005 
long before the image started circulating in the West, and two years before it appeared in the NNN video. Two months before that, in September of 2005, this version of the image was also posted on Pia. This appears to be the furthest back we can track the Jeff image, the version with the least edits. The uploader, a user named Mulholland titled the image, White Powder, Part 2. The words underneath it read, Go out with me. So it seems the image may have been getting shared around as some sort of joke, perhaps making fun of another user's appearance. But notice what somebody commented underneath. I often see this on the net. Hmm, if that's true, then the image may date back farther than we currently realize. As for the picture itself, it's definitely far less edited than the image we're all familiar with. At some point between September and November 2005, somebody painted Jeff's distinctive black eyes on the image and also elongated the sides of the mouth. As some have suggested, the stretched mouth may have been a play on Kuchisake Ona, the split mouth woman from Japanese legend. But I actually think there's a different Japanese connection here. Around the time these images were posted to pia.cc, there was a popular trend amongst Japanese internet users called Kawaii Kusasete, or the Let Me Be Cute Challenge. This was particularly popular on the Image Board 2 channel. Essentially, users would upload an innocent picture, usually of a person or a human-like object, and then ask other users to make me cute. A different user would then make some creepy edits to the picture and transform it into something more kawaii than kawaii. Someone else would then take that altered image and add more creepy edits themselves. This would go on and on, with the picture becoming more and more cursed with every new iteration. During the process, the original image would often get lost, with different edit chains branching off and becoming their own thing entirely. Seeing how Mulholland's image was titled White Powder 2, that could suggest he was playing the Let Me Be Cute game with whoever uploaded White Powder 1, aka the original Jeff image. White Powder 2 was then adapted by another user, and then another, and then another, until it eventually became ah ya 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 ya. Also, as Blame It On Jorge pointed out in his recent video, when we examine the EXIF data of ah ya 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 ya, we can see that it originally went by a different name, Pretty Face. A fitting file name for the Let Me Be Cute challenge, don't you think? There is one final development to cover. Just last year, the creator of White Powder 2, Mulholland Sun, was actually tracked down on Twitter. And, according to him, the original Jeff image was actually a screen grab he took from a video that was circulating around Japan at the time. Mulholland said that the clip featured a middle-aged Asian woman. At a point in the video where she approached the camera, he took a screenshot, made some edits in Photoshop, and uploaded it to PR.cc as White Powder 2. The image was then warped further, resulting in ah ya ya ya, which went on to become a popular meme in Japan. That's probably how Sessa, the creator of Jeff, first came upon it, and, realizing the image wasn't well known in the West, chose to use it as the picture for his story. Unfortunately, Mulholland believes that the video he took the screenshot from has since been lost to time. The final version of the Jeff image we have to talk about is this one. Green-Eyed Jeff. Some have suggested that this is the earliest incarnation of the Jeff image, though it's not clear when exactly it was made. However, as creepy as this image is, it's widely considered not to predate White Powder Part 2. The blurriness and overall lower quality suggests that it's seen more edits. In the years since this mystery caught traction, many photos of real people have been suggested as the basis for Jeff, but none of them quite fit. The backgrounds are too different, the hairlines don't match up, the proportions are all wrong, or the stories behind them don't make sense. There are plenty of great videos on YouTube debunking each of them, so I won't go into details here, but suffice to say, none of these photos fit the bill. All the other Jeff images said to predate White Powder 2 have also proven to be fake. All in all, I'd say Mulholland's version of events seems the most likely, especially since he's the one who posted the image online at the earliest point. The earliest that we know of anyway. But if the videos are lost like he says, then this could be where the search ends. 
But perhaps, in some dark, rarely visited corner of the internet, the video of the woman approaching the camera still exists. If it does, then the people searching for it are yet to find it. Until they do, this is the closest thing we have to the original image. A huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Lydia Glassley, Jamie Dreams X, Nephus1988, Hamish K, That One Guy Thomas, Jesse Jug, Alex Greensall, Alicia Jaggles, Anikra, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Azriel Warakai, Beatrice Matarazzo, Charlie Lackey, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Crawford K. McDonald, Expand Dong, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Leonardo Martinez, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Nadine, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logdrage, Philip Wester, Procupidine Netta, Taylor and Monica Gruing, The Only Dorita, Zane, and The Deck of Cards. Thank you guys so much for your continued support, it really helps the channel out. I'll be back again next week with a new video. But until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.